Thanks to our patrons for picking this video topic. It's the morning of May 5th, 2000, a Friday. You wake up, go about your usual morning routine, looking forward to the weekend ahead. You arrive at work, a nine to five at a nondescript corporate office. You greet your colleagues in neighboring cubicles as you set your things down and turn your computer on. You wait patiently for your computer to connect to the internet via dial-up modem. Your emails finally load. A message from an old flame catches your eye. The subject reads, I love you. Your heart races and you quickly open the email. Kindly check the attached love letter coming from me, it reads. You briefly wonder why the love letter wasn't just written in the body of the email, but you're too curious to question it further. You click on the attachment, a .txt file. Nothing happens. You try double clicking. Again, nothing happens. Before you can figure out why the text file won't open, your coworker in the next cubicle pops his head over and asks why you've just sent him a love letter email. Your blood runs cold. You look around the office. All of your coworkers are staring at you. You look back down at your computer screen, but it's gone black. Whatever it was that you opened crashed your computer and had just spread to every single one of your email contacts. When the Y2K bug didn't trigger the apocalypse at the end of the 20th century, the world quickly moved on from the prospect of a computer glitch that could destroy modern society. Back then, the average person's computer literacy was low to non-existent, and the majority of the world didn't even have internet access. The use of email was becoming more popular, but it was nothing like what it is today. Before there were websites like Gmail, Microsoft Outlook was the default program people used for emails. Companies would host their websites and emails off of the same server, and usually didn't have much in place to protect their systems from outside infiltration. Spam filters didn't really exist because spam didn't really exist yet. On the 4th of May 2000, email users across Hong Kong began to receive a strange message in their inboxes. Seemingly, a love note from someone they knew. They all contained the same message. Kindly check the attached love letter coming from me along with what appeared to be a text file. However, upon clicking the attachment, users were not met with a declaration of love, but instead, numerous files on their computer would get corrupted. The .txt file was actually a .vbs file. Once opened, it would automatically run a script that searched the computer's drives for JPEGs, CSS files, docs, and other files, and overwrote them with copies of itself. As you can imagine, the practice of backing up files wasn't really a thing in the year 2000. The average person didn't have separate external drives and cloud storage didn't exist. So as a result, photos, spreadsheets, documents and other important files that weren't backed up on separate storage were lost. For unknown reasons, the worm only hid mp3s instead of overriding them, so at least your audio files were safe. As well as disappearing a whole bunch of your files, the malware would also automatically send out the love letter email to your entire contact list. This is what caused it to spread across the globe so rapidly. The sender of the email appeared to come from someone you knew. There were no spam filters and human curiosity would take over. And in just five hours, the I love you worm or love bug had ravaged computers in Asia, Europe, then North America. Hong Kong was hit particularly hard due to its close geographical proximity to the virus's origin, which we'll get into soon. The Dow Jones Newswire, the real-time provider of stock market updates, went offline, as well as several investment banks. Some people did realize something was off when they received identical emails from different people, but all it took was a few individuals at each company to take the bait to completely crash servers. The worm then traveled westward as Europe began its working day, the Danish parliament was one of the first major entities to go offline before the UK parliament's email system also crashed. It was estimated that 10 to 30% of UK businesses were hit by the worm, including large companies like BT and Vodafone, and ironically, Microsoft. Universities and government institutions like the NHS and City of London were also struck. Asia and Europe tried to get word out to American offices before they woke up. But it was too little, too late. Countless email users, including employees at Ford, AT&T, Merrill Lynch, and even the Pentagon, opened what they thought was a love letter, only to cause the collapse of their email service. 
It is estimated that one-tenth of the world's email servers went down, and over 45 million computers were affected in total. Cybersecurity firms were inundated with desperate requests for help, but once files were lost, they were usually gone for good. Important information like financial records and military documents were affected. The FBI estimated that the total damages worldwide cost eight to $10 billion. So who or what was behind all this? What was the purpose of this love bug? Tracing the origin of the I love you worm turned out to be a pretty simple process. Firstly, every single computer that got infected with the virus ended up with copies of the code. This made it easy for antivirus services to roll out patches and prevent further damage. The code itself was unsophisticated and consisted of snippets from other existing malware. The code made no attempts to conceal how it worked, and because it was written in Visual Basic Script, VBS, it meant anyone could edit it. Within hours, more than 25 copycats of the I Love You Worm emerged and spread across the internet. Most of them had changed up their email subject and message, or tweaked the code so more critical files would be overwritten and render many computers completely unbootable. The code also contained a few clues pointing to who its creator was. In the first line was a sentiment many of us have probably expressed at some stage. I hate go to school. Perhaps the coder was a student? In the next line was a Philippines-based email address, as well as a reference to a Grammasoft group. The Philippine National Bureau of Investigation, NBI, was contacted by Manila-based internet service provider, Sky Internet. After the worm had first been unleashed, Sky Internet received numerous complaints from overseas IT workers. The virus was skimming passwords off victims' computers and sending them to a server hosted by the ISP. Sky Internet had promptly taken the server down, but that didn't stop the worm from deleting millions of files all over the world. This was a clue to what its creator's motive was though, to steal internet account passwords. Four days later, the NBI tracked the email address and phone number to a small apartment in Quezon City, Manila, owned by Irene de Guzman. Her partner, 27-year-old Riomel Ramones, was arrested. Investigators seized computer magazines, phones, floppy disks, cables, and cassette tapes, but they did not find an actual computer. They also did not find the third resident of the apartment, Irene's younger brother, Onel de Guzman. A few hours before officers across Asia were crippled by the love bug, 23-year-old Onel de Guzman was contemplating a last-minute decision. Onel was the youngest of four children. He grew up extremely poor but developed an interest in computers from an early age. He would spend hours at bookstores reading about computers and then started hanging around in internet cafes to learn from technicians and other IT enthusiasts. His passion for all things computing led him to enroll at the AMA Computer College in Quezon City. He excelled in his classes and started a side hustle building and selling PCs. Most people at his college hoped to graduate with enough qualifications to get an IT job overseas, but O'Neill was talented and wanted to push the limits. He started experimenting with hacking into people's PCs and stealing internet accounts then eventually started a secret club called Grammasoft with a few of his like-minded classmates. O'Neill had recently submitted his final thesis email password sender Trojan, but it had been rejected and deemed unethical. He had argued that internet access was a human right, so he proposed a program that would steal Windows passwords so he could use internet accounts that people had already paid for. At the time, computers were not widely used in the Philippines, and dial-up internet was expensive. O'Neill included some of the code for his proposed Trojan virus in his thesis, but his professor dismissed the whole thing as illegal. O'Neill dropped out soon after that, but continued to tinker with his code. In early May 2000, O'Neill decided to make some changes to his virus. He originally only wanted to target Manila, since only Manila's dial-up internet passwords would work with his phone line. But at the last minute, he decided to get rid of that restriction out of sheer curiosity. O'Neill also needed a way for the virus to spread so he could obtain as many passwords as possible. First, he programmed the virus to mass send a copy of itself to every single person in his victim's email address book. Then, he needed to somehow entice his victims to actually run the script. He figured, what's the one thing that all humans desire? 
He named the file loveletterforyou.txt. He exploited a feature in the Windows system at the time that hid some file extensions by default. The .txt extension in the name was fake, and the real file type BBS was hidden. His victims would click on what they thought was a harmless text file, most likely too puzzled or excited to realize they were actually about to run a highly infectious virus. At 1am on the 4th of May, O'Neill sent his creation to his first victim, an acquaintance in Singapore he chatted with occasionally. He then went out to get drinks with some friends before heading to bed, totally oblivious to the pandemonium that would ensue. Four days later, O'Neill was the NBI's number one suspect. He had been laying low since news first broke of the catastrophic virus. He was terrified and completely helpless, unable to stop his virus's path of destruction. His ISP, Sky Internet, had shut down his servers within hours of I Love You's release, so he never even got to use any of his stolen Windows passwords. He had hidden his computer before the police searched the apartment, but accidentally left some incriminating floppy disks behind. His name had been mentioned all over the news. It was time to lawyer up. Except the NBI didn't actually know what crime to charge O'Neill and Riomel Ramones with. The Philippines didn't have any laws for cybercrimes yet. At first, they considered charging the pair with credit card fraud because they used stolen prepaid internet cards, but that didn't quite work. The NBI settled on charging O'Neill and Riomel with malicious mischief, a felony crime involving intentional damage to property. There was enough evidence to prove that O'Neill was the perpetrator, but the Philippines Department of Justice dismissed the charges because Sky Internet, the ISP, was the only private complainant, and there was no evidence to suggest O'Neill intended to cause damage to them specifically. After the case was dropped in the Philippines, the United States was unable to extradite him for prosecution. O'Neill de Guzman walked away from the whole thing without punishment. On May 11, 2000, a press conference was held in Quezon City, Manila. O'Neill moped into a small room to front the reporters and cameras his sister Irene by his side. He dabbed his sweaty face with a white handkerchief. O'Neill didn't speak much English, so his lawyer Rolando Quimbo did most of the talking. He asserted that O'Neill was not involved in the crimes he had been accused of. When asked if the virus was released by accident, O'Neill mumbled, it is possible. The lead investigator at the NBI, Nelson Bartolome, conceded, they did not know it was criminal. Perhaps it was just a prank. In July 2000, the Philippine Congress hastily enacted a new Electronic Commerce Act that covered laws around electronic transactions, interference with computers, unauthorized access to information, etc. O'Neill gave a few interviews over the next couple of years in an attempt to cling on to his newfound notoriety. He defended hackers and touted his belief that information on the internet should be freely available to everyone. However, he never outright admitted to creating I Love You, now that the Philippines had new laws in place. He suggested to the San Francisco Chronicle that a college friend or possibly his sister had messed around on his computer and accidentally unleashed the virus. The New York Times reported that there was a sense of national pride in the Philippines surrounding the whole saga. Some Filipino tech pundits felt that the love bug finally shone a light on the nation's burgeoning IT industry and welcomed the publicity. In 2020, investigative journalist Jeff White interviewed O'Neill de Guzman and detailed their encounter in his book, Crime.com, From Viruses to Vote Rigging, How Hacking Went Global. O'Neill had gone quiet in the last two decades. He had absolutely zero public online presence. There were rumors that he worked for the UN or Microsoft, but Jeff White tracked him down to a mobile phone repair shop in a busy market in the Quiapo district of Manila. Now, age 43, O'Neill was happy to come clean about everything. He had simply been a poor but ambitious young man who never could have imagined the impact his creation would have had on the world. Back in 2000, Riomel Ramones, along with several AMA college students, had also been named as suspects, but O'Neill admitted that he was the only person behind the I Love You worm all along. O'Neill said he regrets ever writing the virus, especially now that he has two kids who don't yet know about his past. 